Welcome, everybody. This is Rates and Barrels. I'm Al Melchior. I'm here with Eno Saris, and we've got a really, really special episode here for you. Eno interviewed Chris Langan of Driveline. A lot of really, really interesting stuff, uh, uh, some of which maybe you wouldn't necessarily think at first glance is actionable, but uh, you, know, you and I were just talking, and there's a, a lot of little nuggets there that I think are going to be uh, useful to us uh, for thinking about certain pictures and maybe even a little bit more broadly than that. So we'll get to that interview very shortly here. Uh, but before we do, just a little bit of background. So, you know, you were talking with Chris um, about really the process that a pitcher would go through when they go to driveline. So, you know, you and I kind of joked about this on the episode last week about, you know, oh, it's like driveline's like the the new best shape of my life. You go to driveline and, you know, magic happens. But it's yeah, really Danny interesting. Sent, Danny sent me, uh, listener Danny sent me an image of, uh, he went to driveline with the ring with the driveline thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh yeah it's become a, a meme all of its own uh but th- i mean this this kind of breaks it down this interview that you did with chris uh because not only do you talk about the process but there's some really interesting discussion about how sometimes the process doesn't work for everybody or it works in different ways for different pitchers and i thought that was that was really cool um so yeah, you know he gives yeah. us some insight basically into some organizational trends in terms of what teams are doing what and how they're treating large swaths of minor leaguers mm-hmm. um so that i found that part uh pretty interesting and um you know the 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 whole beginning of this uh, i met him when i went and underwent the process that these pitchers undergo mm-hmm. when they go to drive line i did the whole weighted ball uh thing i uh took my shirt off and did the mocap i i i, I threw 59 miles an hour pretty pretty amazing if you ask me no sir. um and uh we didn't quite get into pitch design but that's where uh my story leads uh finishes and uh chris's begins and I uh, hope you enjoy. And welcome back. Uh, we have today uh, a guest I'm really excited to talk to. Chris Langan is the director of pitching at Driveline Baseball. And uh, we met uh, when I was up there with my shirt off, uh, throwing in front of the mocap. And uh, uh, we've been talking ever since. And I just wanted to, uh, the nice thing about talking to you guys um is that you give us a vin- window into what player development looks like uh, at a team level. You you let us sort of know what coaching looks like. A lot of times, uh, teams don't want to let us into some of this stuff, you know. So uh, because uh, you guys are free agents, as it were, uh, you kind of give us a, a little window in. So really, uh, thanks a lot for for coming on and talking to me today, Chris. Oh yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. I, I... Uh, I loved when you came up and you're were, you were wearing the pulse sleeve and getting after a little bit with the the velo. So let's get yeah, to yeah, you ran me through the the arm care routine. Uh, it was really funny. Uh, I've uh, I've been trying to train my kid um, who's now in in uh, little league, and um, I I you know I I tried to without the actual weighted balls. I tried to have some of the exercises to warm him up before we started throwing. Um, and I just had a representative, uh, Charlie Newbar, uh, uh, Lars Newbar's father came down from the pitching national pitching association and, uh, they're a Tom house association. And one of the things that was really fascinating to me was this idea of, uh, warming up to throw rather than throwing to warm up. I think your weighted ball program really is that for major leaguers, but do you have any other aspects of, uh, getting ready to throw that I maybe not have undergone? Like, do you, do you actually expect them to have run or done some light lifting or anything before you even start the arm care routine? Right. So, uh, typically the, I mean, the HP staff that we have typically is going to handle all like pre throw, you know what I mean? Any like warm up, getting like core body temperatures uh, up and whatnot. Um, and some of that may vary. I mean, look, there's going to be, it's not like the end of the world if somebody wants to do, it's cool to have some variance in how somebody warms up before they throw, you know, some guys are going to want to foam roll, et cetera. Um, but our HP staff usually takes care of that for the most part. And that can sort of depend on guys' deficiencies and stuff, how much mobility work they're doing. Uh, but I mean, for the most part, at a minimum, just making sure that the core body temperature is up and stuff, because again, you're kind of once you start, doing the weighted balls and stuff, whether it's pivot picks or your first throws of the day. Um, like you kind of said, uh, you're, you're kind of, you, you, you don't want to go into up. that with your first 20 throws, right? Your yeah. first 20 throws acting as, okay, now throw 21 is essentially my first throw of the day. So. 
Yeah, I mean, on the youth level, it's uh, you show up to practice, grab your glove, uh, get out there and start throwing, you know. And that was sort of a aha moment for me. I was like, that's a really easy thing that we can do in our practice. Hey, run a lap, you know, <laughs> like right, right, run a right. lap, then pick up your glove and throw, you know, that 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 could uh, help some health outcomes. And uh, it's just a su super simple thing. So I think we're going to institute that in our practices and maybe we'll, we'll do some of the running. They were, you know, running with your hands up and <laughs> doing this while you're running and, and doing some oblique work while you're running, you know, just. Uh, just trying to activate all the muscles before they before they just start throwing, you know, but, uh, you know, you know, your uh, your sort of view into the world is a little bit more of an off season view, right? Like you, you, a lot of you guys you work with in the off season, and you'll keep in touch with uh, because there's things that they want to know about, or they want to, you know, they might want to send you some data or, or talk to you about it. But a lot of times you have to sort of let them out into the world like your babies. So uh, I thought it was interesting to talk to you a little bit about this year, the rule changes. Um, I know that um, you're not in a spring training facility right now trying to get them ready, uh, but I would, I'm would i interested to know, like, did you guys uh, install a pitch clock uh, at the facility? Um, and if you didn't, uh, did you do a little bit of work with guys to get them ready for the pitch clock? And if you didn't have that many guys that were in that situation, what would you have done if you were a major league organization? Cause we're seeing, I think a difference in organizational level. Like there are teams that are getting, that are having more infractions than other teams. Like some teams were a little bit more ready for this than others. So I'm fascinated okay. sort of the idea, like what would that process look like getting ready for a pitch clock season? Sure. So, I mean, obviously the, I think the, one of the bigger things is like just seeing if you've got anybody who's like, you know, more potential at being at fault for the pitch clock, right? Like if you've got somebody who's towing on the line at 15 seconds or, you know, anything about 14, uh, you know, when they're not pressured to do anything that probably brings a bigger case to do that. Um, to be honest with a lot of guys that I personally had, uh, and then that driveline had as a whole, I maybe got a little luckier for, for whatever reason, I didn't have a lot of guys who were close to that 15 second mark. Um, but for, to, to be honest with you, uh, you know, like Sean Manaya, one, he's like very close to the, like he was way up there. He had like a really good pace. But like regardless of new rules, old rules, if you've got a guy like that who's going to be on the big league roster, uh, an additional two to three ticks is just like going to be the focus regardless of any new rule changes, you know. Um, so I still think to a large degree, this is actually when you let it kind of play out during these, these months of the year with spring training, kind of when we let them go, as odd as it sounds, um, and kind of let them fail in that environment a little bit. Uh, I know that may sound like a bit odd to people. Uh, well, it's a different and, environment, and like fundamentally a different environment. You're in the training right. environment, and that's a game environment. Right, and, and I think that's the whole point of doing this in spring training. I know a lot of people are upset or just like have quick opinions about it, but like I, I see the pitch clock is no different than like when we're designing a pitch. And it's like, hey, we're not trying to throw the perfect first pitch. Like we're the first 15 pitches we throw in a pitch design setting, I'm not going to try to make it perfect because I, I want them to get some feel of like a simpler cue and kind of go from there. Okay. And then pitch 16, now you've kind of narrowed it down to like, all right, this is what we need to do. I think that's mm -hmm. what Major League Baseball is clearly doing with the, the pitch clock. It's like, hey, 15 seconds, let's see how it goes. Uh, generally, there's just like immediately there's going to be what's happening right now where there's some teams that are Freak or some out. players that are struggling with it, but people are going to adapt. I, you know what I mean? Um, so to answer your question, we didn't have anybody in my estimation. Uh, we did do some lives towards the end. Those guys, we did time a bit. Um, I think that there's just some game environment stuff. That's very difficult to mimic. Like you get a new ball, you want to rub it up. Uh, you got five pitches instead of three. Uh, I do think they should let the pitchers have the pitch calm, to be honest. I, I think that's like, if they want to keep this thing at 15 seconds, I do think that's like one of the more crucial aspects is Get letting the pitcher. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I start, start the communication or help, earlier. Yeah. Or right. Or maybe it turns into like an offensive coordinator type thing where you're, you know, you've got a, like a coach literally beeping in. I don't know, but um, I think there needs to be something I, just, I think enough guys have too many pitches that I think we might be headed towards something like that because, uh, now with the throws over being limited, I really think that you, there's a, uh, impetus for the, uh, throws over to be called from the dugout. So now you're, uh, you're, you're, 
because you really they're a precious resource, you know, and you don't want to throw over if you don't have to. And so you kind of want to manage that. And so we may see a little bit more control out of the dugout. But, uh, you know, there's this, there's these funny trends in baseball and there's like there, sometimes you just can't tell about correlation and causation. So we've looked and over the course of the last, you know, 10 years or so, as long as we've been able to to measure it, uh, pitchers have gotten slower. You know, the pace has gotten slower and velo has gone up. And so there's been a real like assumption that uh, those things are linked and that uh, and it makes a little bit of sense from a weightlifting standpoint that like if I'm trying to do uh, reps at a max, like I could maybe, you know, take more time between each rep and I might be able to do more reps of my max. Um, however, um, I looked at like guys who had changed pace and there was no real velo, velo differential. Um, and I believe we've talked about this a little bit, but like you guys don't coach guys like you guys are trying to coach guys to their upper ends of their velo. That that's that's part of the driveline uh, philosophy. But you don't coach guys to take longer on the mound. Like you don't right. tell yeah. people to go slower. Like you haven't that hasn't been part of the driveline ethos in the past, right? Like that's not part of what you guys coach. No, there, there's occasionally guys who like when we do like bio below where basically they're in an environment that's way like for, for reference, I won't get into it too much, but we will throw these different type of balls and basically throw them as hard as we can uh, to, for the most part. And it changes the environment a bit. So guys, what will happen is they take 12 seconds between pitches while they get in this drill and they take about five seconds. And, and that's mm. like, all right, take a second. But yeah, for the most part, uh, I think guys kind of have their natural, hey, this is what I'm comfortable with. And obviously some of these guys are going to get nudged towards uh, being a bit quicker, but I look, I, I know some of the the research and such on like taking time uh, between reps and stuff with the, uh, I look, I, I'm one of those people. I just don't think this is going to make as big of an impact on those types of things. I really personally don't. I, I figure if it would, you would see more guys who are at this upper end of pace that, because to be frank, hey, some team would call them up and yeah, some team would call them up and they'd be like, Hey, let's get this guy slowing down six seconds and see the velo uptick. Yeah, out, yeah, you know? exactly. So, yeah. So uh, see all the teams, especially the smartest teams, all of a sudden all the raids would be like, you know, at 25 seconds, you know, <laughs> like, right. Okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on here? So I think, I think so, you're right. Yeah. Also, what aren't we seeing? I don't know how much uh, spring training you're watching, but uh, aren't we seeing that like a lot of hitters are uh, actually getting, it's like, seems almost like more hitter right. infractions. And if it's hitter right. infractions, it could actually be the hitters that are pushing the pitcher pace. Right. Like, if right, right, right. Taking no, yeah. I, that could be part. I, of yeah. It. I think the, yeah, I would say the hitters is honestly probably the, in terms of like getting balls, uh, things like that, or, or strikes called on them. I think the hitter is probably the one that right now is in my estimation, looking at it, maybe making the, the bigger adjustment. Um, it, it should like, you just do not want to get a hitter infraction. I feel like it's just like the, uh, you want to make the pitcher throw the ball. Like, yeah, I, I didn't know, want to give up a strike, that, like, it's man. Too hard to, it's too hard to throw a strike, you know. Um, so I think the hitter is penalized a, a lot more if they're not ready than the pitcher, you know. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, at least. Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, one thing that's interesting to me about uh, pitch design, uh, you you kind of were just talking about it, was this idea um, you know, out in the public sphere, we see more of the successes. Right. We see uh, like you guys with uh, maybe a Ronaldo Lopez image thing or or the, the Matt Brash one was pretty cool where you're like, hey, we're trying to teach him a cutter. Here's some like struggling with it. And boom, here's the cutter. It's beautiful, you know. And so we and, and we see the Ronaldo Lopez or we see some of the Mitch Keller stuff out of tread where you're like, oh, man, like they said they did this and they did it. And it's awesome, you know. Um, but you're, you when you're talking about like if we had the first 16 throws, like we're not really looking for it to be perfect. Uh, what's the sort of role of failure in pitch design? And and like, is it, is it much harder than people think? I mean, I think people now think that with all the data and the tech, you just say, okay, uh, he went to driveline and, and developed a cutter. He has the cutter. It's hundred percent lockdown, ready to go. I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't work that way, right? Like pitch design is not something that's a hundred percent science. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I think that, Thing where maybe it comes off as easy or it's like how how did this guy develop the pitch so much quicker is we do have more data with the hawkeye implementation um obviously us in general generating our own data with cues and things that we're using to kind of try to get the ball to move how we want to so there is a 
process that I think is a heck of a lot better than it was before of like, is this guy a good candidate for this pitch? If mm-hmm. like, whether you're going for, uh, you know, whether you're going to max out the stuff plus of the pitch or you're going for like just core results, you know what I mean? Like right. and we're always shooting for results, but like you at the big league level, you'll get some guys who are just like, boy, he needs to get a righty out. So like, we're going to sell out for this shape, even if it's, uh, you know, if he threw, threw it both the righties and lefties, it wouldn't perform as much as another pitch mm. shape. Um, so I think there's definitely a, an analytical layer of like, all right, this is a good pitch shape for this player and it makes it quicker, you know? Um, but yeah, I think or what, what I've learned in my estimation of doing it is you want to basically, if nobody, if somebody has not thrown the pitch shape before, get them to exaggerate it in both directions. Like if they're trying to throw a sweeper, make them throw something that's just the most massively ridiculous. huge, yeah. right. Massively huge. And then have them go the other way, make them throw something that's like, you know, they get behind it too much because it just, it generates feels that they then know, okay, that's bad. That's bad. That's good. That's good. That's bad. Okay. Now I know what the good one looks like. And I think a lot of times it's kind of with this pitch clock thing too. People are, it needs to be 18 seconds. It needs to be 20. Well, just like, but let's let's see what happens after you know each game and see how much those reductions, uh, how much less people are getting penalized. You know, so it's kind of that same uh, trend. But trying the, to find uh, the right feel in between two extremes. Right, right. Um, but like the grip stuff, the seam orientation stuff, uh, that stuff is, is you know we we didn't have that I think uh, before 2020 or at least teams didn't to the level they knew like the importance of it probably wasn't known. Uh, and now that it is, it's much easier to create some of these pitch shapes uh, and do it in a, a quicker manner. Um, but are to your you, point, there is some. Go ahead. Go ahead I mean, are there just like are there just pitches that uh, that you come to the plan with, and the, the, they're just not going to have that feel? Like they just, it's just not, it's just not in their in their in their toolbox. It's you know, I I used to think of like pitchers as being sort of natural supinators and natural pronators, right? And so is that just part of the thing that you come to the table with? We're like, oh, man, it looks like you're sort of a natural, uh, you know, pronator. So, you know, we're, you're probably not going to throw this uh, amazing, uh, uh, what is it? Probably a sweeper is, is a sweeper hard for a pronator. You know, there are there there's some yeah, pitches so it's, that it's are. Typic- it... Right, right. No, there's definitely like there's an element of like splitters with over the top guys for sidearm guys like good luck like it's very difficult to get yeah, somebody who's sidearm to throw a split. Yeah, right right, right. Yeah. uh and then there's also uh if, if you've got a guy who's like you know middle and spin efficiency or he's like you know let's say a pronator is 100 percent a supinator is anything below 85 uh-huh. if you've got a guy with 85 percent spin efficiency and you're going to try to tell him to turn over a change up you know that's you know you, you shouldn't even be really trying that you know what i mean so mm. there's certain Basically, as you bias towards one end of the spectrum and as you're evaluating like, hey, how's this going? You sort of have a mental clock in your head of like, if we're trying a cutter, this guy supinates well uh, and like the first five pitches aren't going well. There's a hell of a lot more persistence with that guy to keep attacking it than the the guy who's like a little bit more pronation bias. You know what I mean? And then there's there's, getting uh, better at fitting the new pitch type. It's not just like. You know, I think in the past there was like, oh, well, you need a change up. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, 100%. Or, you want to be a starter? You need up, a change right? up. Like, <laughs> yeah. Now it's like, right, okay, right. The, the... you know, you have these by like you have these tendencies with your right. mechanics. And so we can we can probably give you this instead of this, you know. Right. And the type of change up, too. I think like, you know, it's it, I think everybody still wants a starter to have a change up. You don't have to. But the difference is, is now we can kind of, hey, you take it on the one seam, just throw it, uh, you know, try a, a, a split change up and put a little pressure in these fingers and throw it normal. Uh, so like there's basically different, you know, you'll get a guy who doesn't have a change up, but the only change up he's been taught is to turn it over. You know what I mean? Mm. So like effectively he's never been taught this form of a change up that fits his, it fits his biases better basically. Right, um, right. And uh, with the spin tilt and observe tilt, you can also kind of see if it's a coaching fault or the athlete's fault. Basically, the idea would be the athlete well, doesn't know steam orientation type stuff. The coach should, you know. Right, right. I, the one question I had about that was, uh, so Hawkeye has directly observed spin axis, and that was a big leap forward in our model, and our stuff model was a big uh, change in it when we were able to, to put in the differential between observed and inferred spin axis, so basically seam-shifted wake, right? 
Um, what sort of products are there out there, data products, uh, tech products that that can do that other than Hawkeye? I just talked to Rapsodo. They have a new seam orientation product in, you know, seam orientation aspect of their new newest product. Is that uh, how do you how do you tackle seam shifted wake in your in your training sessions? Sure. So I think at a I think at a core, you know, the the track man does now have uh, the ability to do inferred and observe. Okay. So now it's not like perfect on every pitch type, but you can see that in the individual session. Obviously, when you're working with big leaguers, you've got the data from the season and yeah. you can see that. So that's like a, you can kind of almost go into the session having an idea of what grip they're using. Um, and then the, the rap soda is also another way to get some inferred stuff. It, that'll get you the most amount of like inferred observed if you have that paired with the track man and, you know, with, with what we have at least. Um, well, it does speak to, it does speak to this. this inter- yeah. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. So the, the seam orientation stuff specifically is going to be more looking at the, for us, at least at the current point, looking at the camera and, you know, kind of verifying, uh, you know, did this guy get too far up in front of his sweeper? Did he get too far down? Is he getting the right spin efficiency? So the edutronic is still um, really important. The, the high high res image. I think is still so. Really I, I think that I think that's got to pair that, that with what you're seeing. I think it, I I still think too many people are maybe just due to difficulty of setup and like the you know getting the settings for for outdoors indoors. I think that mm. camera is not used enough in in pitch designs. To be honest with you, even though it's been around for so long. Um, there's so. this there's this interesting aspect to to stuff plus. I know that stuff plus is part of the coaching process for y'all, um, but I've noticed that you know every time we train our stuff plus, like our stuff plus is a baby because we only do have Hawkeyes. So we have three years, right? And in those three years, we had COVID, we had the sticky stuff enforcement. You know, now we have pitch. Like it feels like it's been a pretty tumultuous three years, and and the sticky stuff enforcement. We actually saw a change in league wide stuff plus with the sticky stuff enforcement. So. Um, one thing that was interesting to me is that like our stuff less has improved, our model has improved as we put more data in. Um, but it is a kind of a living model because, you know, you want to be unique as a pitcher and, uh, you know, unique is better. And the model is pretty good at, at doing that. But then we start chasing unique. So the first few people that threw a sweeper, I, I don't know who the OG sweeper is. Is it Kluber? I don't know. There's a, there was like a, there, there had to <laughs> I, been, I, I, is it maybe? Yeah. I mean, he, yeah. Cause he called it a curveball. Um, right. Right. Yeah. yeah I, but, I get your point. But you, I, I think I know where you're going with this. So we yeah, have like a, there was a, there was an OG sweeper that in the model was really good. And so that, that produced good results. And now everyone's throwing a sweeper, you know, it's like this, the sweeper is the big thing. And uh, the more people do the sweeper, the same thing has happened actually with vertical ride on fastballs uh, that, you know, it used to be that like 17 was good enough, I think in terms of induced vertical break. And now you got to chase past that because 17 is almost average. Right. And the, as soon as something is average, the hitters are like, okay, I just target the top half of the ball. I got it. You're a vert guy. I got it. I got it. I've seen it. I've, I see a ton of you guys now. Like there's everybody's a vert guy, you know? So you have to chase vert beyond it or start doing these cut ride fastballs that are people are doing, uh, you know, or, or maybe we'll see the return of the sinker, but anyway, we're always chasing unique. So what happens when, after you've taught everybody a sweeper, <laughs> like does the sweeper <laughs> still perform the same way? Or are you just going to chase a new pitch type? What, what's the role of sort of, uh, it's almost the, the role of like skepticism and open-mindedness. Like, you know, there might be a new pitch that we don't know about yet that that is more unique and it might not look great in our stuff models now, but you know what I mean? Like what is the, it's changing right, right. over time. Like what happens, what happens when you teach everybody a sweeper, what happens next? <laughs> right. So I, mean, I, th- I think your point is right. Of just like the constantly getting more of this data and seeing like, like the, the numbers I have in my head, I think is like uh, in 2020, 15% of righty sliders had more than 10 inches of sweep. And last year it was 26%, uh, which is a massive, that's massive change. You know what I mean? I think year over year, man, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's just, uh, and that was also with like a lockout, you know what I mean? So uh-huh. like the, you think about how many more we'll probably see this year. Uh, there's just one, I think, and I'll get to your question, but I'll, I'll kind of just very quickly, briefly summarize this. The stuff model has obviously influenced people to make shape changes with far more confidence than they did previously. Um, where you get like a spring training at most and you know there's some variance but also, by the, sweeper, a lot. the sweeper doesn't look amazing like if you're scouting it like if you're watching it a lot of times the sweeper doesn't look amazing you know what i mean it looks kind of like a slower cutter or something you 
Right. It, it probably depends too on another thing is you might just introduce more bad sweepers. You know, that that's part of it too, which is why the mm. stuff model is so important is because it's like, well, if he throws a gyro 88, like, and there's obviously other elements like command and things like that, that I don't think there's just so Gilbert much came up, Logan Gilbert be. came up with the, with a sweeper and that was better by stuff plus than his gyro slider, but he can command the gyro slider a lot better. And so, right. you know, just he throws, the gyro nine, throws 98 with extension. He's right, right. over the top. Um, <laughs> And that I, I think too, seem like, that doesn't like seem like the profile that, that uh, of sweeper guys. Right, right, right. Um, so there's definitely some, you know, the, the first mover advantage, if you want to call it that, has probably been lost in that. But mm. I, I mean, it's, it's also just like no different than like, you know, people throw more sliders than they did, you know, 10 years ago by a decent bit. That doesn't mean that, you know, you, you, you don't have the variance team to team, maybe you used to, or like the ability to like just do that and be good. But it doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't throw more sliders still, you know, NBA. Mm. What, what the interesting one to me is the NBA, because what basically happened is everybody shot three pointers and now what everybody happened, has to shoot threes. <laughs> right, so, yeah. So what happened is I, what the offense is way better. And what you did instead of, I think everybody thought what would happen is three point percentage would go down as people took more, but what they did, they just introduced different players into the league and took those old five, you know, Andre Drummond, those types of guys just like don't have roles anymore. Right. Um, but to, to get to your question on the sweeper specifically, uh, like hitter behavior has been much better against it, I think, over the last three years. I think uh, just better swing decisions on it is number one. You see it more. Um, I think the the stat I had was like 59% in zone swing percentage in 2020 or 2019. Now that's up to 65%. Um, and they're chasing it a little bit less too. So I think people are seeing the shape more. Um, they're having, having a better idea of how to hit it. Um, now that doesn't, again, I still think that, you know, if you're a right-handed pitcher and you cannot get righties out and you have any capacity to supinate, like it's just still a really good pitch if you can command it, you know? Um, so I, I think, I, I think obviously hitter behavior is the biggest thing that changes there with the sweeper and such. Um, I, I don't know that, you know, I think we're probably going to start approaching guys are throwing this pitch and they shouldn't be, Um but if you look at like the Yankees and the Mariners minor league, like numbers, like they just have every single pitcher in their orb throw it. And until they know, decide it's bad. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And that's like, people think that's like, I get how people can think that's, it is oversimplified, but at the same time, like this pitch you is might as well cycle through it. Might cycle through it. See right. if you can do it. Right. 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 But I don't, I don't know if that answers it uh, enough for you, but I do think the, the other thing well, is just the command. I, I think people really underestimate, you know, you could have two really good stuff plus pitches, but if it's a sweeper and it's a big curveball, and you can't, you have 30 command. What can you throw in the zone? Give, right. What are you giving that guy then? You know what I mean? Right. It's, you know, you got a fastball maybe, but if you're throwing a sweeper and a curveball, guess what? Your fastball is probably not that good. Cause like the trade off to the, the typical form is like, if you can throw those two pitches with high stuff plus, Fastball is usually going to be cut a little bit and not necessarily in a good way. So, right. And, and yeah. it, I've seen too many uh, profiles of pitchers where they have a high stuff plus pitch that they just can't throw. Like Carlos Rodon right. has always had a high stuff plus changeup and uh, he just he can't really command it. So it it's really can only be almost a waste pitch, you know. And then there's other pitchers uh, that I've seen that only have fastball command um, and uh, you just get keyholed. Uh, because they're right. like the only thing, uh Oh, it's two Oh, the only thing you can throw in the zone is the fastball. You know, So I'm going to get ready for it. hundred percent. That yeah. And uh, to answer on, on some of the pitch design stuff you're talking about there, that is where a lot of the selection bias uh, kind of dies. So you'll have guys. I think the best example, to be honest with you is splitters. I mean, you get an over the top guy, they'll throw a damn good splitter in a, in a pitch design or a few of them. It looks great. Uh, and then it looks get, great in the in the moving right. images they throw on Twitter, right. you know. <laughs> right. And I mean, we've I mean, I've posted a few of those that yeah. but like uh the the point is a lot of times you gotta know what you're competing against. Like how good was the previous change up, right? If they're just not gonna have a change up, you should do that all day and see what happens, you know. But I think mm. that's probably the splitter is probably the best example of like there's guys who could have absurdly good stuff pluses with it, but you just don't see it even introduced into the data because they know what's going to happen. You know, it's just going to be too many balls. Um, and, right. and to your point, I've seen that a ton where uh, I genuinely think like people look at the MLB and they look at stuff plus, they look at command plus, whatever you want to call it. And they think 
Well, what like they don't realize that there's some pitchers that actually have way better stuff plus potential, but to your point, they can't command the pitch, so they don't get to throw it. So their stuff plus is reduced. That's an example of command actually holding back somebody's stuff plus because they can't mm. get into contact. They 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 don't have maybe the ability to throw these swing and miss pitches in contact inducing counts, if, if that's what you want to call them. And so they just throw average fastballs, and that's not the pitcher they were in the showcase. You know what I mean? Well, hey, hey, I just got a driveline guy to talk about command. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you guys were just about throwing it as hard as you can. You guys, nobody, nobody in the driveline can can put it anywhere. <laughs> Don't you? Hey, I try to. A, a, a well placed eighty eight mile an hour fastball can get people out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're trying to always set up our guys for success. I mean, there's definitely a component of definitely a component of not a lack of you know, insufficient command data, I'd say to like, you know, give an athlete feedback in an off season, we've got some intended zone stuff, but I do yes, think that's, that's something minimum. that's kind of new, right? Like the intended zone right, stuff. Yeah. Is that, is that just talking with them uh, about like, it's sort of getting a, an intention from them and knowing what the intention is and then, and then tracking the miss like, or is it, or is it because you're not in a game situation, the glove target is actually the exact target. And then you can just go from glove to acquisition. So, so what we'll do is, uh, I mean, there's two, there's one like dude has no command, just set up down the middle, which a lot of guys are like that, to be honest. I'm not, I don't and then care track where you're the from. Middle, middle. Yeah. Right. And so people are wondering what the, what the hell is the point of that? Like you're just going to keep, but the idea is then you can see the How misdistribution. Miss. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I think the, the common thing is everybody go middle, middle, but there was one guy I worked with. Um, and I mean, I, I don't like revealing names and stuff, but he missed arm side of his fastball all the time. All of the time. And so is the question his, is, do we change the mechanics? Is there something mechanically there? Or do we just change where we're aiming? <laughs> right. No, no, that's always how I'm thinking. I think that's always how driveline people are thinking. Yeah. It's like, can we just change? You know, it's like the, the Derek Jagers has a good, if you had like a presentation, just like if you're playing darts, everybody knows the like triple 20 is the best throw per se. But, you know, you can probably average more points if you account for like your inability to command the dart. You get what I mean? And that's no different than uh, baseball and what the, the Rays have kind of done. But my point on that is this guy basically, uh, righty lefty command with fastballs completely different. Splits were absurd. And I really think it was mainly because of this command difference. Um, but he always targeted his fastball away to both handed hitters. Well, when he threw it to a righty, it would run back into the zone. Strikes are really valuable. You know, that, that worked. When it was lefty starting at arm side, every miss is this way, right? Uh -huh. So okay, we can yell about him pulling his torso off and all this stuff, or we can kind of do our jobs and just put him in a, in a better just position. Just aim in. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and so the idea is you can extrapolate that with every pitch type. And then um, ideally you start with the tactical, hey, let's change the sights, et cetera. And then uh, at the very least, you at least have something when the guy's throwing, uh, it's maybe a bit more deliberate because you know it's being he knows it's being tracked. And then you can kind of see, how the the miss distance changes um, essentially, um, but yeah, I that's yeah, that, that 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 I think is kind of the the thing that needs to kind of be configured. But I think at a minimum, setting guys up for success, whether it's hey, here's where we should probably put the glove um, and simulate like a thousand pitches and see what like the command ERA or the plate location plus would be, and then um, like I said earlier, you just got to set guys up. Hey, let's take 10 points of slider stuff plus off. But if we throw a gyro pitch, we do have a lot of stuff in our, uh, some of our research that says, Hey, this pitch, it's easier to get closer to your target. Um, and if you're closer to your target, your, your balls are more competitive. You've got right. a better shot at chase. You know, we got a, we got a natural sense of your, uh, of your mechanical inclinations, supination, pronation, that sort of stuff. We have a natural sense of your command, uh, you know, your, what your natural command is, you know, and given those things, we think this pitch is probably the best way to go. Uh, so, but, and all that stuff can be measured. So you can get a better sense of what the natural command is. And you can look on the editronic and actually get a sense of, you can look at their spin ax, their axis, uh, I mean, their spin uh, efficiency and get a sense of, you know, pronation, supination. So, you know, put all that together, put a plan together, coach them. I mean, I love your process. It's, it's really great. And, and data at every level, what's cool is to hear you say, 
um, that uh, that you have been tracking hitter tendencies at the major league level versus some of these newer pitches like a sweeper. Uh, so you're on it in terms of, you know, what happens as these things get more popular and we, we start disseminating more of them. Um, one last thing. Uh, I noticed that uh, Matt Brash is um, a cutter, cutter, sinker, uh, slider. Um, and I think the slider uh, is a bit of a sweeper. So uh, so kind of cutter, sinker, sweeper. I also noticed that Hayden Wisniewski in the Cubs is a uh, cutter, sinker, sink, uh, sweeper. Um, is this a kind of a new prototype for, you know, hey, none of those pitches is a, is a change up. Uh, but, uh, it looks like a full arsenal that, you know, you can do something against both handedness and, uh, there's command pitches in there and action pitches. And, you know, is that, is that the new sort of fastball slider change up? You know, is that, is this a new model for a, a complete starting pitcher in a way? Man. So I think the, I think like the basic, if you're in the minor leagues right now, like, right. Where there's just like the, um, uh, here, but like the whole point of the stuff plus thing to me is more for like these minor league guys in my estimation early on. And this like, Hey, like, you know, 4% of these guys, free, you know what I mean? There's just like, you've got like 90% of these guys who just need massive variance in their potential because they're too, they're just not projected to be anything above double A, you know, mm. those are the guys you can have this like pretty simplistic process of like, well, if they supinate, we're going to sweep Cutter, them, sinker, cut them sweeper, yeah. and then sink them. Right. And then if they're a pronator, whatever you want to call it. Well, they hope they better have a good four seam profile. That's that'll be um, vert, uh, downward right. slider, like power, power right. slider. Yeah. Right. Um, and they might be able to turn out, you know, Devin Williams. I, I've had a heck of a time actually like, teaching or maybe a splitter that, because but, they're over the top. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so that's kind of the simplistic view of why those trends are occurring so much, I think is like, mm. it's just like fits into those. And then also, Against sweepers, and all of our like non-elite prospects, we can sort of a couple so. buckets and just be like, "Hey, yeah. you're the you're the power cutter side, and you're you know you're the the power slider side, and you're the the, the cutter swing sweeper side." And right, right. And then you you know, as, as basically what happens as guys scale up through the system, you start to recognize you know you get to a, a threshold of it's like, all right, let's get a little more contextual, add context, um, and that's when you might change the sweeper to more of a gyro. And now you've got to determine what you want to do with this cutter. Um, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Things like that. But I think at the minor league level, I think, I think that's where it's more like, it's just also difficult to get this stuff communicated in those, those orgs, like top down, bottom up, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, so like those right. processes, yeah. those processes are, are sometimes really it's just easier to be simpler, right? <laughs> you know, than, right. Oh, yeah, attack, for sure. Cause you have for so sure. many players in minor league system. It's kind of hard sometimes to be like, we have an individualized plan. That's amazing for every single player. Oh really? <laughs> How many players? Do you right. Have? Yeah. right. Right. Yeah. Um, you can get too, you can get way too descriptive trying to, you know, I think when I read a lot of pitching analysis or things on like fan graphs, whatever it may be, and obviously I, I, I like reading that stuff, but I do occasionally just see some like, you know, when we go in and develop a guy, whether it's a MLB team or us, like we don't have hindsight, you know, so we're, we're trying to do the best with like the pitch modeling, what their command is at the time. Um, and you end up with a lot of like, oh, this guy's good because he tunnels his pitches. And it's like, well, I, I don't know. I don't I don't know that I would have thought that slider was, you know, are you telling me I should get every single guy Amir Garrett slider now? You know what I mean? It's just like, <laughs> right, I, don't, right. I, don't, I, I don't I don't know that it's I don't know that that's gonna there is still individuality like that that shows yeah, itself, sure. especially at the, the very highest level, the very elite. You know, it's funny, right. too, because whatever they're teaching our kids, you know, even uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie Newpar had to say, yes, yes, I know that what I'm teaching you right today, you know, there's major leaguers who are not doing it. But there are major leaguers who do all sorts of different things. You know, and like we can't just right, look at right. every major league and be like, oh, this guy does this. So my kid should do it that way. No, it could just be that that guy is elite and a unicorn and crazy. Like, you know, so um, anyway, uh, it's uh, it's been you've been super nice with your time. And uh, and uh, I really appreciate it. that was a really fun conversation. Uh, and I hope our, our listeners got some some value out of that. And uh, Chris, I hope to see you around uh, the backfields or maybe I'll I'll have to come up and see if I can blow harder than 59. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, yeah, for sure, man. No, I appreciate it. I could have done this for a lot longer. I'll we'll have to get one of those stuff plus beers too and chug those down soon. So. All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, that was just a fantastic interview, you know, and, uh, you know, also the a little bonus of you doing an impersonation of the driveline skeptic. 
<laughs> I that was well, well online, done. Online, I think. <laughs> good uh, stuff, good stuff. Pitching Twitter does sound like that sometimes. Yeah, I think it was a good personification of it. Uh, I think we can all <laughs> all appreciate that. So uh, there, there's one or two things from that interview that I just want to dig a, a little bit deeper on and, and make it a little, maybe a little bit more actionable too. Um, so. Uh, you and Chris talked about, uh, you know, pitchers trying different shapes, different pitches, new pitches. And uh, I know you and I have talked a little about Matt Brash and how uh, there was there was some hype around the the new cutter and uh, his his tweets about it. Uh, but is Matt Brash somebody that you think needs to use that pitch? Who are some other pitchers maybe who who need a new pitch this season? And, and we should pay attention to whether or not they do that. Yeah, one of the things I think is super interesting about Matt Brash is, you know, one of the the the, the hashtag on the hype video uh, was make them swing. And so the idea is uh, he doesn't have good command of his fastball and he throws a sweeper, which is a breaking ball that is also not a hard to command and b big shape. And so basically batters are coming to the plate and deciding that they're going to wait and they're not going to swing. And so the cutter for Matt Brash was is really important because it's a pitch he can throw in the zone that has movement that might make them think, oh, it's a slider or, oh, it's a fastball, but he can command it because the movement is smaller and he can throw it in the zone. Now, theoretically, that's great. That could make him a starting pitcher. It is, in fact, the same arsenal that Hayden Wesneski has in terms of cutter, sweeper, uh, uh, cutter, sweeper, sinker. That's like the foundation of Wesnensky's thing. And we heard that there are teams that are just taking all their low spin efficiency fastball guys and saying, hey, try the cutter, sinker, slider, you know, sweeper method, you know? Um, however, we also talked just uh, in the last interview session uh, after, after Lars Newtbar took us through uh, his training methods about the role of skepticism and open-mindedness in fantasy analysis, uh, fantasy preparation, in life in general, really. And uh, I think this helps us at least, not maybe in life in general, I'm uh, uh, maybe a little too open-minded on that side, uh, but in fantasy, it does actually give us a really interesting way to track things, which is, A, notice the hype video on Twitter that says, pitcher A has a new pitch. Great. That is a piece of information. And if you could jump into the future and knew that, know that they actually used it, then you could be actionable on it. But maybe you shouldn't draft Mash Rat Rash as a starter until you see him throw that pitch in spring training. Because to date, Matt Brash has not thrown the cutter in spring training. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little bit of a like uh, an actual sort of process you can undergo where you say, OK, I saw Ronaldo Lopez, you know, has a great new change up or whatever it is on their hype video. Uh, well, go check the spring training game log and see if he actually even threw the damn pitch because they have to have they have to have they have to believe in it. Uh, in order to execute it, they have to believe in it to, in order to use it. And uh, to, for whatever reason, Matt Brash is not quite there yet with the cutter. Yeah, I, I think that this is a really important thing to raise because, um, you know, for example, last week we went through some really, really early uh, spring training results, very small samples. And, and even as we get later into spring training, there's all kinds of reasons to distrust the numbers, players trying out different things or a different level of competition or, or whatever. Uh, and, but there are certain stats that are not the typical stats that we look at that I think are indicative of, of things that are important. And, and so, you know, the number of pitches that a pitcher throws of a particular pitch, especially if it's a new pitch, that's really meaningful. Uh, and yeah I, yeah, I think that that's, um, you know, where the focus should be maybe more so than uh, the, the, the top line results. I'm really uh, fascinated, for example, uh, with the two pitch pitcher idea. Um, there's a, a, a I had a piece coming out next week about uh, Spencer Strider. We, we talked about that in great length. Uh, last year, I was fascinated with the idea that Kevin Gossman could just throw a four seam fastball and a splitter, you know, almost all the time and, and succeed. Uh, what we have seen uh, last year is Gossman throw the slider more than he ever had before, you know? So, um, and, and we've seen this in the past with, uh, here's another guy, um, uh, Robbie Ray, 
uh, you know, sort of adding the sinker to the package in order to make it make uh, keep batters off of uh, off of his his four seam fastball. And to me, one of the biggest names uh, that my model never really liked that other people really do like um, and who throws a lot of pitches, uh, you know, uh, a lot of pitches without throwing a third pitch is Brady Singer. Mm -hmm. And he throws a uh, sinker and a slider. And uh, last year started throwing the change up this year so far, seven out of, I think, 47 pitches uh, were change ups. Um, and that's right there on the bar uh, between, you know, having a third pitch and not. Um, and also uh, the model still doesn't like it, <laughs> but uh you know, you know, the other thing that's uh, that was good about having uh, projections uh, that park adjusted and stuff uh, is that uh, Brady Singer still gets a three seven ERA uh, in the projections because it's a good park and uh, it's a decent division for parks. And so, you know, worst case scenario, Brady Singer gives you a three seven three eight ERA uh, with some strikeouts and you're not hurting too bad. But I don't think we're going to get a repeat of last year. Yeah, I think Brady Singer is really interesting, and he's somebody that's you know really intrigued me since uh, you know com coming up in in 2020. Uh, he's really really good at freezing batters, uh, even with just you know having the two pitches. So, you, I mean, do you think he really needs the third pitch, or can you just look at the results and say, well, you know, he's he's got this skill that he's been able to demonstrate without that that third pitch? You know, just no, there's no reason to think that at this stage hitters could be able to adapt. I, uh, if your two pitchers are super, super dominant, like Spencer Striders, I am, I have more of an ear for it because basically Spencer Strider has a top three fastball, maybe the second first best fastball in the game. And then also a really dominant, uh, slider. And then the singer is more, um, pretty good and pretty good which is i want a third pretty good you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> like two pretty goods i don't think uh does it for me but i've also also been out on on robbie ray in the past and uh been burned this way um and so uh i will say that the the industry is divided do you know that the uh, founders of baseball prospectus uh, uh one of them was james click and he was arguing that uh pitchers starting pitchers only need, they didn't need three pitches and so basically at the foundation of the beginning of one of the most venerable uh, sites on the internet in terms of baseball analysis, at the very beginning, they were arguing about whether or not uh, starting pitchers needed more pitches. So uh, this is a tale as old as time. We may not figure it out here, but at least we can tell you uh, that, uh, you know, what, verify uh, that someone is actually throwing this this jiffable pitch before you go all in. The other thing I found that, that I found interesting what you said was he's very good at freezing people, and what we heard uh, Chris talk about was was this idea um, that um, as uh, as players see a pitch type more often, their their performance or their their actual process yeah. against that pitch will change. And I think we've seen um, that a little bit with uh, four seam ride. Um, and I think we're seeing we're in the middle of seeing it with sweepers. And so um, this idea that you just said, like, oh, uh, well, he froze. He froze people really well. Um, is that uh, predictive in the same way? Um, because we just heard that once people saw shapes more often, they started swinging more. Like once they started seeing sweepers more often, they started swinging more uh, at, at, at in zone and, and chasing less out of zone. So Singer was good at freezing people, you know, in the zone last year. But this year, they're going to have seen the change up more often. And mm -hmm. they're going to have seen him more often and neither pitch uh, rates as, you know, like a top 10 type pitch um, on its own. So that's why I think there's always the value of that extra pitch where you're just like, oh, you haven't seen this very much. Oh, oh, I, oh, he just threw a curveball for a strike. I wasn't thinking curveball. He didn't throw the curveball. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's why that's why I think the like the strider proposition is so like through the roof, you know, like so, so good that maybe it'll work, but for everybody else who lives on this planet, like Robbie Ray. Yeah. I'm going to throw a sinker. That's not really that good, but it's another pitch. Uh, Kevin Gossman. Yeah. I'm going to throw the slider. It's not a very good pitch, but they don't expect it. You know, it's like the don't expect it part. That's really important. So 
we heard a lot about, you know, just looking into uh, what it's like to use Stuff Plus uh, in your analysis that Driveline does very heavily in player development, how that intertwines with what we how we should be thinking about pitchers in fantasy how we should be thinking about starting pitchers in general so hopefully even though it was kind of more of a baseball-y thing uh there's uh it'll get the gears going I, I i wouldn't be surprised if there was a study or two that you know popped out of this that does actually uh that does actually tell us something about you know who we should draft this year <laughs> yeah yeah because when when he made that comment about hitters being able to uh you know kind of catch on to shapes the which makes total sense the more that they mm-hmm. see them and you see that uh z swing percentage go up i would love to test that out i think that you know that may be a column that i do this yeah. year and and i think it's actionable too because in the case of somebody like singer uh or you know i can't think of anybody else off the top of my head but somebody that you don't have to draft all that early it it's becomes an interesting experiment where you could draft let's just say for example singer and if it starts to go south in april you go to those those granular um Plate to oh, he's not freezing people pitch. as much anymore. They're all they're all swinging his stuff in the zone now. You know, yeah. Oh, that's uh, different. That yeah. doesn't sound good. <laughs> the, the sooner you have a reason to, you know, kind of buy into the yeah. regression or buy you know, out, you have, you have yeah. a sell opportunity. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah, I'll be certainly thinking about ways to apply it. So um, thank you for doing the interview, and of course, uh, we thank Chris for for doing the interview as well. Really, really interesting stuff. And uh, that's going to be uh, be a wrap then for uh, this episode. So uh, if you want to uh, reach us, you can uh, find us on Twitter. Uh, you know, at, at Eno Saris. I'm at Al Melchior BB. And uh, we'll be back on Friday with uh, another episode, everybody. So uh, we'll uh, see you then.